Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? Tough loss for the Flyers. We'll talk about it all. I have some very interesting things to say. Before we get there, if you're new to the channel, smash the subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button as well. Come join the party. It's a lot of fun here discussing the Philadelphia sports teams on a daily level. And real quickly, if you're looking to buy tickets to any NHL, NBA, NFL games, you can utilize the promo code BRODES at SeatGeek's checkout page for $20 off. I'm basically giving you free money. Take it. Take it right from my hands. SeatGeek code BRODES. Get yourself to a game today. With that being said, enjoy the show. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. A very disappointing loss by the Flyers tonight. 5-2 to two at the Wells Fargo Center. It's their first back-to-back -back losses this season. But to be fair, their last loss, that well, I should say the first loss in this back-to-back -back loss scenario was in a shootout against the Tampa Bay Lightning. So it's not as if that was a disaster. And the word disaster is perfectly said here to transition into the discussion I want to open up the show with, which is, you know, I feel that there are fans that claim after watching this team play to this point, that they are a disaster, and I just can't get behind that. It's frustrating, and it's annoying, and yes, they show some inconsistency at times, and there are flaws with this squad. I just feel that it's taken to a wild extreme saying that this team is going nowhere when they're 16 games into the season. You can point out their issues on the power play. You can point out their lack of creativity at times on five-on-five -on -five hockey, but I'll also point out to you, and I don't know if the news is going to get any any better, but when you're losing your number two center and your number one defenseman on your roster, yeah, you know what? It's going to be harder. You're not going to look like the same team as you possibly can be when they are healthy. And every team goes through health, and especially nowadays with COVID protocols, you see that teams are losing players. You have to battle through that and fight through that. You have a brutal stretch coming up with some teams in Florida, a squad in Carolina that's going to want to get revenge on you for Carter Hart stealing the show just a couple games ago in that third period, which was a remarkable effort. But my point is, while it's not the greatest in the world, I feel that this team is nowhere even close to as bad as the fan reaction makes it seem to be. And that annoys me. It really does. Because there are times where I see this team play with an attitude and an edge that we haven't seen them play with in quite some time, which I do feel results in success over a long period of time and they have to bring that out more intensely. For example, the second period, Rasmus Ristolainen changed the trajectory of this game when they tied it up 2-2. Two to two. There was a burst because of the way that he brought his energy and his physicality. Nate Thompson brought it as well. Scott Lawton brought it as well. Hell, Joel Farabee is dropping the mitts with Charlie McAvoy who was awesome to take off the ice for five minutes of play. I love that. I love Joel Farabee too. I want him out there as much as possible. But if you could take away the Bruins defenseman and Charlie McAvoy, please sign me up for that, right? I mean, I just thought that there was like this toughness, Sean Couturier threw the body around during that span in that second period, and you could see what was generated, that buzz and that life, and getting the power play to even tie the game up for Broussard's second of the night, all because Ristolainen is behind the net and getting in the face of the Bruins, and Brad Marchand's in the mix, and he ends up going to the box. I mean, that is extremely important, and and I believe that is winning hockey right now. Look, I'm not someone who bangs on on the table screaming, you have to fight three billion times and be that level of goon. But what I do think is important is in years past, what do we say? They're not tough enough. They're too soft. They never go on their toes and force other teams to be on their heels when they're on the forecheck. Let's say the Flyers are on the forecheck, right? How many times in years past would a team be afraid to go into the corner knowing that there'd be a big body who's willing to bang down low? The answer is never. They have that, and I think if they continue to build into that brand and build into that identity, there's some legitimacy to what that can provide for this team success-wise over a longer period of time. So, you know, they just haven't had that, and I think they do do some good things. They do some bad things, though. Don't get me wrong, right? Uh, when you lose a battle in the second period right before the period ends, and Scott Lawton's line gets beat, and, and here comes uh, Forbert, who scored a second of the night, where you walk in with all that time and space to rip it by Martin Jones's ear. That's unacceptable. Now, I have two things I want to throw out there. One, with Ryan Ellis in the lineup, Nick Sealer isn't. And I'm not going to tell you that I'm not 
pleasantly surprised with what he's brought because I probably would have thought it's been it would be more miserable than what it was. You know, that's just not the case when your number one defenseman is out there. He wouldn't be out there with Keith Yandel, who I think has his struggles as well, but that's what happens with your 5 and 6D. I'm bringing that up because, well, Justin Braun moves down, Ryan Ellis is in there. You see how great Justin Braun's playing? Well, think about him and Keith Yandel being your 5-6 instead of a sealer, but I digress. You win your puck battle along the wall. We're not even having this conversation, so shame on the forwards for losing it the way that they did. Now let's get to Martin Jones. When Travis Sanheim gets toasted wide and you get beat short side, does Carter Hart get beat that way? And even with that four-bird shot, which was sensational, does Carter Hart get beat that way? I'm not telling you that Martin Jones was pathetic tonight. That first period, the fact that it was only one nothing, is truly huge, and he played a big role in that. He did enough as a backup netminder. If I'm looking at it as, what did your backup goalie provide? Did he do enough to keep you in the game? Sure. By the end, it's somewhat snowballed out of control, but he kept you in this as long as humanly possible as a backup. He probably would like some back, but at the same time, you know, he kind of gave you what a backup goaltender gives you. I just wonder, though, is it different if Hart gets the nod? And I know that there's a lot of hockey games coming up, In a a short span, you're playing six games in nine nights or so. So it's going to be difficult. That's why maybe you go with Jones. But I was looking at it as this week you got three home games. And I would have loved to see Carter Hart against the Flames, Carter Hart against Tampa. And then, you know, is it ridiculous to think about Carter Hart against the Bruins as well? I'm not disgusted with the idea of what they did. I'm not disgusted with the nod. I mean, when Martin Jones is playing well, and he has to this point, you know, I also feel let's get him back in there as quickly as possible so maybe he can build off of that confidence and just continue to keep this thing on a roll while he's getting plucked in there here and there at a, at a consistent pace. You know, maybe he can kind of keep that ride as long as humanly possible. So, uh, you know, I'm not mad that they did that. I just also thought before the week began, is, is there something to Carter Hart getting a nod consistently considering the night's off in between? But um, look, you know, the first period, Martin Jones was good. I just thought that they got outworked with a minute and 35 left. Sealer got outworked. Yandel got outworked, which here's your Bruins fourth line winning battles. Curtis Lazar banging the body. And then, you know, you're wide open in front of the net with a little backhand cheese about two feet or two inches, I guess I should say, right in front of that blue paint area. Martin Jones gets beat up high. You can't have guys left wide open that way. In this league, they're absolutely going to bury. But there was something that I absolutely loved in that first period that's going to get unnoticed right now. Take away the score of the game. Take away the emotion of the loss and just look at this in a vacuum. Claude Giroux beat out in icing, and he gets down low, and he wins his battle, and the crowd's going crazy, and it's it's such a little thing, right? Especially these days, you see icings get beat how many times? Not often. They normally give it in favor of the team that's skating back towards the goal line because when they change the rule, I don't have to explain to anybody when they change the damn rule from the goal line to the top of the circle at all. It's just barely called these days where teams can play out that icing because the player technically beats it. They're wrong majority of the time where they probably should let it play out and they don't due to safety if we're being honest with ourselves. But anyway, here's Claude Giroux just working so damn hard. Electric, electric effort. Gets down low, wins that battle, wins the race. And it actually generated some buzz at the time. Keith Yandel put a clapper on net that was saved. Cam Mackinson had a great A scoring chance. And I just love the fact that at that time, you know, I don't know the outcome of the game or what it's going to be. But during those moments, I'm like, I love G. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is fantastic. It's beautiful. He also had a, he came out of the box when the Flyers were killing a penalty. He gets a breakaway. Not as much time and space to dig into his repertoire and maybe pull out a fancy Claude Giroux bingo that we all go, what the hell was that in her pants? fall off, right? Not enough time, good angling to get back. But damn, I just, you know, I I love the fact that G is is bringing that attitude that he has been. And yeah, it's unfortunate that that third period ended the way that it did with the brutal call where it's clear as day that the referee botched it. Now, we know that the fact that they scored one power play goal was uh, uh, something I admired, you know, to anticipate two in one game considering how poor it's been is probably naive. So I can't sit here and say the referees gave that one away even though Pasta had a filthy response where he's knocking the puck down on a two-on-one saucer pass attack 
attempt. He throws the puck back the other side, eventually gets it. Patience, patience, patience. Waits out Martin Jones and puts it into an empty net. You felt that there would be a dagger when the five-on-four pretty much got eliminated. It became four-on-four hockey. Like I said, I can't anticipate a goal being scored there on the Flyers' power play, considering how putrid it's been to this point. But if you are a referee, I just don't understand how you fucked that up. I don't understand how bad you could be at your job. And then, how about maybe you get it right? Let's just go back to the basics here and say, well, hold on a second. There's so much damn technology. There's so many different ways to get this right and to figure this bad boy out. Why don't we? Why don't we be clear here, go back and see what went wrong instead of just botching a huge part of the game that clearly took the flow away or the potential flow, I guess, is the right way to describe it. Uh, Instead, you know, it just kind of goes back in the other direction and uh, it sucks from there. So, yeah, I mean, that's... That's kind of where we're at, but when you had the the breakdowns, like Sanheim can't get beat wide that way. It's just totally unacceptable. I can't I can't look at Martin Jones and uh, not look at it. Like you can't get beat short side there for the score to be. Well, that was the four to two goal. Um, just unacceptable. You know, you you allow a. It's pretty crazy, right? So you allow a late first period goal. You allow a super early, albeit very fluky, when Justin Braun in that second period. The puck goes right off of his stick and past Martin Jones. You get scored on late first. You get scored on early second. You get scored on late second. You get scored on in in the third first. You know, that's just not a recipe for success. But I I will give them credit for their their fight back in the second. If I'm going to look at that sort of uh, just angle in on the way that they played, what they did there, there's something to that over the rest of the season. That way, that toughness, that edge, that attitude, that swagger. Here's Travis Konechny getting in the face of some guys and chirping away, right? There's some buzz. There's some life. There's some flow. I've seen that more this year than I ever have. Ristolainen being a big part of that. Let's bottle that up and say, we, we need to work off of this. There's something to that that I, fu- I, fu- I firmly believe. Excuse me, I was trying to say firmly, fully, whatever. I firmly, fully believe we, we can work with there. And that's not something that I'm accustomed to seeing out of this hockey team. I get it, though. There's a, there's a lot of frustration with them. A- at the end of the day, they were playing, what, 16 games at this point? They're 18, fi- or excuse me, they're 8, 5, and 3. So that's a 500 record, if you will. You grab some points, and it's unfair. You lose in a shootout. That game against Tampa could have went either way. It was a coin flip. They had so many opportunities to score in the overtime period. Three on three really could have ended in the Flyers' favor. Then we think differently about it. And that's what I was saying even after the Tampa loss when everyone was all up in arms. I said, look, if you win against Boston, that's five out of six points in one week on a homestand. But now you look at it a bit differently because you only snagged three Three out of six, and yeah, it does not get any easier. But I'll I'll go back to something that I am not going to just rule out, and I know it's not easy to say right now because of the emotions and because we're right in the thick of it. The Nationals do not have a good record at the break. The Atlanta Braves do not have a good record at the break. And especially in hockey, I don't want to give a... Like, I, I don't care what you think about November hockey. Think about the Eagles right now. What did you think in September? What did you think now that we're watching them play and they're winning games and they're creating a little bit of life in who they are? You feel differently a handful of months later because the team grows and blossoms into something new. Maybe this is who they are, which is a 500 hockey team and it's the same song and dance. Maybe that's possible. I just can't grab that information and fully make that assessment right now without seeing more hockey, without seeing three, four months down the road. If I know anything about this damn sport, get the hell in. The Montreal Canadiens make a run. The New York Islanders make runs when you think, hey, maybe they're not the same team as they showed in the past, right? Barry Trotz behind the bench. He gets his team flowing when they need to. So my point is, November hockey is what it is, and I'm not downplaying the start of a season and how important it is to get in on the right foot, but we know that it's going to be tough sledding along this window of time, and if they keep their head above water, who knows what can happen in February, March, when it comes down the stretch, if they just keep their head above water throughout this really tough time. Like, I can't expect dominance when they play Florida, when they play Tampa, when they play Carolina. They're not a team that has full-on dominance, but they can hang in there, show some fights, show some things that I believe will work long-term and can create 
something positive. And I know it, you know, that's it's normally not me, to be honest with you. I'm normally kind of picking at it and nitpicking and going heavily and probably being more negative than positive when I should and trying to look at every angle. And I'll nitpick some angles that people get uncomfortable with. Uh, but I'm sort of the other way right now with this team where uh, I, I look at the full body of work and I've seen so many things that are impressive that I can hold my hat on. And yes, there's been some disappointing things, but a lot of those disappointing things come into they're, they're not playing with the team that they should be playing with. I mean, you brought in Ryan Ellis and, and Kevin Hayes the, the the other year. That's a major acquisition. These two major acquisitions are just not there for you right now. So, I mean, that's important to me. That's important. You might not have them for some time, though. The The way that they're treating both of these injuries, if we're being honest, doesn't seem optimistic. And maybe you are down and out with some of these players for a long period of time, which will be crushing. And I'm sure we'll get an update as soon as possible here. They're trying to push it back, probably because they're waiting for information and seeing if maybe with Kevin Hayes it's something that he got the surgery on. I don't know. I'm just speculating. I think there's clearly a correlation between why they open the window and say, hey, like 24 to 72 hours or so. Was it 48 to 72? Regardless of what it was, when they give you a couple-day window right from the jump before you get any more info, they're probably doing some testing to figure out exactly what went wrong. And and if they are out with them for a, for a long period of time and this is what you have, sure, I get it. But I also feel that you can win some regular season hockey games and you can still hold your own with this, even with their flaws. Just have to, if they get better on the power play, we don't talk about the lack of scoring as much. And I firmly believe that there's more left in the tank on this power play than what we're getting because at the end of the day, there's too much talent on that ice. Cam Atkinson, Giroux, JVR, there's too much talent on that ice to just be this putrid where you can barely set up. So I, I threw that tweet out there because someone tweeted that. So I'll, I'll go through my little my little tweet, if you will. I tweeted out 24 minutes ago. The Flyers clearly have flaws, flaws, but I also feel fans take it to an extreme, making it seem they are a complete disaster. They have very impressive wins this year. It's too early to say they can't do anything. Be hot in May. That's the name of the game. Then Real J Schmo responds, this is a broken record, Broads, if they get hot. They are the same team every year. A borderline playoff team with no consistency and an inability to generate offense 5-on-5. Five five. They aren't a complete disaster, just the same flawed team that we have been accustomed to watching. So then I respond to, to J Schmo. It's November. What were you saying about the Eagles in September compared to now? It's too early. You may be right by the end of it, but it's not enough to truly know. Doesn't help your down number one defenseman and two center, which absolutely matters. So I know I kind of touched on that throughout the podcast to this point, but just kind of giving you the full thread and this response. And he responded, it's November hockey for the rest of the Metropolitan Division too, and they are leaving us in their rear view mirror. You don't win the cup in November, but you can lose it. Now I see now you're you're acting as if these teams that start out hot are going to be 10, 10 and four, like the Rangers, for example, right? Or, or the Capitals, they're 10, two and five. You think they're going to keep up that? level of 10 and first off that's 10 and 7 if you're going to use the Flyers losses in in overtime and in shootouts to their disadvantage in conversation as well to make them a 500 team the Capitals are technically 10 and 7 at that point which is not anything wild and mind-blowing and elite right yeah the Hurricanes 14 and 2 but I've seen so many teams have this ridiculous record and then guess what happens we watched it with the Tampa uh, not the Tampa Bay oh yes excuse me the Tampa Tampa Bay Lightning when they played the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets a handful of years. Uh, you can have a nice start and all. And that doesn't mean the end all be all. It doesn't mean you're going to go win the Stanley Cup because you're winning a lot of games in the regular season. Now, of course, that sets you up to get into the postseason. And that is priority number one. Get yourself in. And then you never know what can happen. But then let me use that back to my advantage as well. Which is, if you are a team that slides in late. If you are a team that just sneaks in and finds a way to grind in by the end. I don't give a damn. I don't care if you have the most points or the least points in the playoffs. Because I've seen crazy things happen. Now, clearly, it's not easy to do that. It's not like something that you want to uh, be consistently every single year. But at the same time, I can't rule out the legitimacy of getting into the playoffs in this specific sport. And getting in. Because this isn't the NBA when you're the 8th seed going up against the number 1 seed. It's completely 
different. And, uh, I mean, come on. Uh, you're acting as if, like, and that's where we go wrong again, where you can lose the playoffs in November. They're 8-5-3 and three with 19 points in 16 games. Uh, I mean, that's not, you're not, <laughs> you're, let, let's go. So the Islanders are 5-6-2. and two. You think the Islanders are having that conversation? You're not the Coyotes who are 2-13 and 2. You're not the Kraken 4-12 and 1. You're not the Canucks 6-10 and 2, right? Then we'd be having the conversation. But once again, it gets taken to this wild level that makes me a little bit aggravated if I'm going to be honest. All right, let me tell you about my friends over at DeSimone Jewelers. They are my jeweler. I got my fiance's engagement ring there. I went back for her birthday. I went back for Valentine's Day. I go, I went back for Mother's Day. You name it. They're a family-owned business located in Haddonfield, New Jersey, previously in Jewelers Row. Uh, it's a family, and I truly mean that. You're not just a customer. Will, Lou, Nick, Mike, they sit down with you. They treat, they educate you like no other. They sit down. They're so damn passionate about the jewelry business. It's almost so refreshing to know they care so much. Like, seriously, some people you talk to, oh, the sales, the sales. It's not about the sales. They really want to educate you and get you the best possible design they can at the most reasonable price you'll find in the market. Custom jewelry design, jewelry repairs, appraisal, watch repairs, diamond setting, jewelry cleaning, and so much more. Make sure you check out their information down below in the description. Tell them Broad sent you. Their website is dsimonejewelers.com. All right, let's go to the Anytime Hotline, and let's hear from you after the game. Here we go. Bad way to end the home stands. Totally embarrassed and outclassed tonight. Flyer games as of late are taking on a pattern. They're giving up at least one goofy goal a game that hits something in the air, hits a shin pad, a helmet, whatever. Tonight it was Justin Braun stick and goes in. But the more disturbing pattern is, again, the Flyers' lack of offense. And it's to the point where we've got to start checking the back of the milk carton. You know, we talk about building blocks with the Eagles. Who are the building blocks for? Flyers on offense. Has anybody seen Joel Faraby lately? Travis Konechny, Oscar Lindblom? These are the young players that are supposed to be pillars of the team moving forward, and they've been missing in action pretty much all year. Yeah, I've been hot on the Oscar Lindblom thing. I, I just think that he's overrated by the organization, and I'm not telling you that he can't play in the NHL. Does he have a skill set that can hold his own? Maybe, and all. I mean, maybe, but you know, you can't rely on him to be what he once was for that one year. With Travis Konechny, now I think Travis Konechny can play. I just don't love him on the third line with an Oscar Lindblom and a Scott Law. And, like, he's not a player that's just going to full-on take over a game just because of himself. Now, if he plays with, I believe, a skill set players, a Claude Giroux or a Sean Couturier or a JVR even, maybe, possibly. You know, these higher skill level level players, you know, it puts Travis Connecting in a better spot. And that doesn't mean that he's not good enough. That doesn't mean that he's not valued or, or something along those lines. Because, yeah, there are players. It's it's very rare to have dominant game. To, Claude Giroux is one. Sean Couturier, I, I feel he's been a little bit quieter than I would have liked him to be at times so far this year. But he does have the the capability of dominating full games. Not many teams have multiple players. It's very rare too. Yes, the perfection line. Ironically enough, you're looking at a Pasta. You're looking at a Marshawn. You're looking at a Bergeron. Yeah, they have. That, but that's rare to have that type of perfection line. Outside of that, how many many players do the Bruins have that can legitimately do it? The Flyers seem to have two off the top of my head, and the Bruins have three. It's not like they're far off from that, but you are right where Joel Farabee a little bit quiet as of late, and that's why I think he dropped the mitts, because he's frustrated, but it also makes sense because he's so damn young, and I even said that it's hard to demand a Joel Farabee to keep up that pace that he was on last year when he's only 21 years old. I was going to say 22. He's 21 years old. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that he's not able to have that type of pop right now. How many 21-year-olds just come into the league and dominate and become a lethal weapon that is so damn hard to stop? He flashes excellence, and I think over time, those flashes will become more consistent. So, instead of a three-game window and then goes quiet for six, it'll be a five-game window of, of, of solidness where we're really 
really excited about what he brings to the table, and then maybe one or two games, and then back to another five. But it takes time to kind of learn, get your body right, bring that level of of work ethic to the gym in the off seasons to bulk up, to get faster. The list goes on and on. So I mean, it makes sense that at 21, Joel Faraby isn't putting the entire team on his back and all. But yeah, I mean, I think G is one, and I don't think he's going anywhere. Honestly, I know the contract conversation was what it was. I think that he'll be back at the end of the day because he wants to be a flyer for life, as he should be. So your answer is Kuti and G right now. And and then by the time maybe they're no longer is when the, the Joel Farabees and the Travis Konechny's kind of take that leap where they eventually become those style of players, if you will. Maybe not to the level of G because he's very underrated and people don't seem to realize how awesome his career has been and how dominant his career has been. Once again, it's rare to find someone who can have over a thousand games played and possibly have over a thousand points at the end of it as well. And then he gets taken for granted, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I understand your your frustration. Uh, I do feel that, like I said, I'm more in the outlier as I'm not as frustrated as others, even though I do see the flaws with this team. It's just not time to say that they can't do anything in November. It's November. I'm willing to give them time. Whether you're right by the end of it or not, uh, I still see enough positives with this team, even through the flaws, to put my hat on and say, well, there's something to this, basically, is my message. All right, what's next? This is not necessarily for you to uh, put on the air, but when I was first married, and I'm the Georgia guy, I would sit out in my car and listen to Gene Hart and Don Earl, and uh, I miss the Broad Street Bullies. You know, I miss the Broad Street Bullies. And I love you so much, my boy, and I wish you success. Well, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate that. I know you started the call off uh, saying it doesn't necessarily have to make the air, but that, but that's some kind words for sure. And uh, you saw, so I thought in that second period you had a little Broad Street boys in you. Just to be fair, for being honest, no. I mean, Faraby drops the mitts. Him and Charlie McAvoy go after it. Ristolainen was a pest, and he was in your face nonstop. And Nate Thompson threw a big hit. Scott Lawton threw a big hit behind the net. Kutsi got in there and threw his body. I mean, there, there was some Broad Street bullies action. I, I Look, I, I'm, I'm the last person to talk about the whole fighting and the, the 70s style of hockey and whatnot. Uh, but I will say that there is a just a, a vibe surrounding this team or this organization, especially after what they did to Tockett and what they did to Homer, uh, that in, in terms of fan connection with that, that not, not necessarily the style of hockey, just the organization, the connection between fans and the Flyers back then compared to fans and the Flyers now. And yes, the passing of Ed Snyder plays a massive role going super corporate plays a massive role, and uh, it's just unfortunate because there's no one who grew up in my era that, ha- as much as I love the Flyers and I put all my blood, sweat, and tears into them, as a lot of us do, uh, it just doesn't relate to, let's say, how my father grew up with, my dad was a season ticket holder, like just a typical Flyers guy, and um, you, you just, you don't have that anymore, and it's it's unfortunate, and, and, and it goes deeper than just, well, they've been mediocre. It, it goes way deeper than that. This is a systemic issue with the organization organization and the way it's ran more so than it is well they just haven't been good um yes that could play a role but I think it's more of just how the fans are treated and how the the disconnect with the family oriented ties it's it's just gone unfortunately but that's kind of where we're going to end things here I'm fascinated to see how they play if you look at the schedule their next game is Tuesday night against the Lightning they play Tuesday Wednesday back to back and then Friday on Black Friday at 3 30 against the Canes so we'll kind of see how they respond this upcoming week not getting any easier and uh, I'm sure there'll be some some frustrating plays and moments in there as well. And we'll kind of see how it shapes up. And with that being said, I want to thank everybody so much for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sports Talk with Broads. And I will see you next time.